Australia's Tasmanian devil. Renowned for its dangerous demeanor and terrifying temper. This is the world's largest carnivorous marsupial. They're fearless fighters. And frenetic feeders. Spending their lives screeching through the wild woods of Australia's island state. Tasmania. It's just one corner of this colossal ancient continent. Home to some of the planet's most unusual and fascinating animals. This is the secret life of the Tasmanian Devil. When the first European settlers arrived in Australia, they found themselves surrounded by animal life that was utterly unfamiliar to them. They came up with their own names for these alien creatures. The koala was dubbed the monkey bear. The spiky echidna became the porcupine anteater. And the oddball wombat, a marsupial, was called a badger, a beaver, and even a pig. These exotic creatures both mystified and delighted the new Australians. But there was one in Tasmania that totally terrified them. <coughs> the settlers found the spine-chilling shrieks and unearthly wails that echoed round the bush at night so disturbing, they thought the animal that made them must be a kind of demon. They called it Beelzebub's pup. Beelzebub being one of the names for the devil. They're the size of a small dog, but so fearsome was the reputation of these animals, the early European settlers believed that if they fell from their horses in its territory, Beelzebub's pups would rip them limb from limb. Today, Beelzebub's pup is called the Tasmanian Devil. And although it's never actually dismembered a human, it's still famous for its extraordinary screeches, yowls, and ear-splitting cacophonies. as well as its ferocious disposition. Devil fossils date back 70,000 years, suggesting the species is a relative newcomer.
This carnivorous marsupial is a pocket predator that carries its young in a pouch and is always itching for a fight. In the wild, they live solely on the island of Tasmania, off the southeast coast of the Australian mainland, full of their preferred habitat, open forests and woodlands. It's thought that devils once lived on the mainland, but died out there, perhaps because of competition with the dingo. A wild dog that arrived in Australia thousands of years ago and became an apex predator. But the dingo only made it to the mainland, which had already separated from Tasmania, so the island offered a safe haven for the surviving devils. But now they're facing extinction. The species is suffering from facial tumour disease a deadly affliction they pass to one another through biting. It's estimated that since 1996, the population of Tasmanian devils has reduced by more than 80% and they're now officially designated as endangered. It's nearing nightfall, and young male Carlos is emerging from his den. As devil numbers are in such sharp decline, he's part of a monitored population that is regularly health-checked by conservationists. He's got an excellent sense of smell, and he picks up on a scent. He sets off from his den to find the source. At two years old, he's now an adult. Lifespan in the wild is only around five or six years. He weighs over eight kilos and may reach 12 kilos. All that weight is packed into a stocky body between half and three quarters of a metre long. He may be modest in size, but this is one of nature's most formidable predators. His sturdy physique is packed with muscle. His legs are short and strong, while his large head and neck support one of the most proportionately powerful bites in the animal kingdom. The equivalent of a dog four times his size, or for his body mass, more powerful than the bite of a tiger. The short, broad skull shape means the muscles in the jaw have increased leverage easily capable of crushing the skulls of live prey and slicing clean through bones, fur and sinew. Large parts of the devil's waking hours are taken up with trying to find food. Mainly nocturnal, but happy to move around in the day, the devil's robust frame means it's able to travel long distances at a stretch, up to 16 kilometres at a time, looking for live animals to hunt or carry them to scavenge.
Although it doesn't defend a territory, it does have a home range that it regularly travels around. The size and shape of these ranges depends on how much food is in the area. Carlos is on his evening foraging expedition. And it isn't long before he runs into another devil. Devils spend a lot of time alone, but their home ranges often overlap, and when they do meet, there's almost always a fight. For the pugnacious, peppery devil, brawling comes as naturally as breathing. Females are just as feisty as the males, and equally likely to engage in a rage-fueled fracas. For the males, it's all about dominance. Gaining ascendancy over their rivals will pay off once breeding season arrives in March, as females often favour dominant males. But these power plays to decide top devil take place all year, and they can be about almost anything. Arguments can happen over having the whole log to themselves. Or a blow-up could be over a tiny scrap of food. To a devil, it's all worth fighting over. Which is why a disease passed through biting has been particularly devastating to them. At the moment, Carlos is the local top dog, the most dominant male. He has to be even more aggressive than everyone else to keep his title. and he has to maintain his position all year long. Carlos has a pretender to his throne. Two-year-old Mungo. Every chance he gets, he challenges Carlos. He's looking to eventually usurp Carlos and take over his position as dominant male, giving him better chances at mating time. But so far, the battle-scarred Carlos has always chased off his challenger.
He takes a lot of damage, but his backside is armoured with very thick skin. As well as giving a competitive edge at mating time, being the dominant male also gives an advantage on a day-to-day -day basis, at dinner time. He gets the first chance to feed. Tasmanian devils will eat almost anything. Insects, rabbits, rodents. They'll even actively hunt large live prey. Active hunting usually takes place at night, when the devil's eyesight comes into its own. It can see best in black and white, and its vision is based on movement, enabling it to spot the tiniest twitch the prey makes. White markings scattered over its flanks, chest and legs may help break up its distinctive predator outline. Hunting alone, using a combination of ambush and pursuit, a devil can bring down animals almost twice its size, like wallabies and wombats. It's an efficient, deadly hunter. But its real forte is scavenging. Devils spend most of their time looking for carrion the carcasses and remains of dead animals. It's not uncommon to encounter it in the bush. Although devils live mostly solitary lives, when they find a large meal like this, they're able to come together. Much like vultures and hyenas in Africa, by cleaning up carcasses, they keep the bush free from rotting meat that could spread disease. And they're a friend to the farmer, who would otherwise have to bury the bodies of dead livestock. This is one of the devil's most valuable roles in the ecosystem. Like many carnivores, they use the easiest and fastest route through the carcass. By ripping their way through the tail area and the stomach cavity first, they can access the rump muscles and intestines as quickly as possible, leaving the harder to eat parts, like the head, for the latecomers. The devil's dentition is adapted for both capturing live prey and crunching carrion. Like dogs, they have a whopping 42 teeth, compared to a cat's 30. Long, sharp canines hold and pierce prey, and molars shear through fur, sinew and skeleton. They can eat all but the very biggest bones in a carcass. Tasmanian devils have even been known to chew through heavy steel wire. There are some large biological differences between marsupials like the Tasmanian devil and placental mammals like dingoes and bats. Marsupials have very short pregnancies and give birth to tiny unformed young, which then develop within a pouch. Most other mammals develop inside the mother within a placental sac. Marsupials also have a metabolic rate around 30% lower than placental mammals. This means they can live using much less energy, a distinct advantage for when times get tough. But in times of plenty, the high-octane lifestyle of the devil 
means it typically uses more energy than its vegetarian cousins. So it aims to consume about 15% of its body weight every day. For these committed carnivores, the search for food is relentless. The local males notice something nearby. Their sense of smell is so acute that they can detect food from around a kilometer away. They stand on their hind legs to give them the extra height they need to pick up on a scent carried on the wind. When on the hunt for large prey like wallabies or wombats, the devil uses a mixture of stalking and short sprints. It relies on stamina rather than outright speed, but can still manage around 25 to 35 kilometers per hour for a few hundred meters. But if they're lucky, it'll be an easy meal, an animal carcass. Devils have struck gold. It's the remains of a wallaby. At first glance, it looks as though the devils are displaying their usual sky-high aggression levels over the carcass. But although it seems like a free-for-all, in fact, there's some devil etiquette at work here. The attitude is still present, but the bloodshed is absent. When feeding at a large carcass like this, the Tasmanian devil has evolved to be communal, which is extremely unusual for a carnivore that spends most of its time being solitary. Everyone, even lower-ranking individuals, will get to feed, even if it takes them a while to pluck up the courage. <laughs> Communal feeding means all the local devils get a good meal at least once in a while, and that's evolutionarily advantageous for the whole species. But it means they have to make the switch from all-out war to having some table manners. At a big feed, they avoid direct conflict by using ritualized posturings. Although they snap and scream at each other constantly, their teeth rarely actually connect. Their profuse whiskers extend to just beyond the width of their shoulders, so they can use them as sensors to judge the distance between them and another devil. They may jaw wrestle where they stand up and place their paws on each other's shoulders or chests and shake their heads constantly while vocalizing. <laughs> this behavior is about each devil defending the amount of food that he needs, not the whole carcass. This is how they can all feed together. The size of the carcass affects the extent to which the feeding devil will chase off a challenger. And as this carcass gets smaller, dominant male Carlos decides his neighbor needs to back off. But even this exchange is without injury to either side. Ah! 
Whilst battle may be temporarily suspended, the noise level is still high. And this has its own important function. It alerts other devils in the area to the carcass. So they can come and join in the communal feed, saving them the energy of looking for other food. Tasmanian devils have many excellent adaptations to Australia's often harsh environment. A vital one is that they can consume a massive 40% of their body weight in a single sitting. They then store this extra fat in their tails, giving them a superb advantage in times of famine, which can occur in the dry forests and coastal woodlands they prefer to live in. Unlike some of Australia's other marsupials, devils can also very effectively control their body temperature. This thermoregulation means they can be active in the often blazing hot daytime without overheating, which vastly increases their scavenging and hunting opportunities. Another adaptation is that they can get most of their water requirements from their food. This can help them in case of drought. A lower ranking male picks up a scent. His eyesight is the weakest of his senses in the daytime, but it's good enough in combination with his sense of smell for him to find food when it's light. It's a lizard, a prime candidate for lunch, if he can track it down. The lizard takes cover under a rock. But the devil has another handy adaptation. Wide feet with claws ideal for digging. Something scares him away. But he soon comes back. This time, nothing will stand in the way of him getting his meal. The next animal to wander into devil territory is much more prickly. It's an echidna, an animal only found in Australia and neighbouring New Guinea. And it's utterly bizarre. It's from an early branch of mammals that still lays eggs like a reptile. And the males have a four-headed penis. Like the equally rare platypus, it's categorised as a monotreme, an animal that just has a single opening for excretion and reproduction.
When threatened, it curls up and relies on its spikes to deter the aggressor. The spikes are actually modified hairs and they're a sharp and effective deterrent against even the super teeth of the devil. The echidna can move them individually or in small groups. This means it can use them to right itself if it gets upended. Even though the strange newcomer appears to be impenetrable, its discoverer wants to keep it to himself. But eventually, they both have to give it up as a mission impossible. <laughs> Meanwhile, Mungo, trying to climb the ladder of dominance and usurp Carlos, comes across a lower-ranking male who's found a piece of meat. But before Mungo can get involved, top devil Carlos turns up. Now, a third devil joins in. Finally, Mungo gets in on the action. He grabs a big hunk of meat and makes his escape. The rules of tolerance that come into play at a big carcass so everyone can get to feed simply don't apply when the find is small, like here. It's every devil for himself. Carlos makes off with a large piece of the meat. and the other two fight over the scraps. Mungo did well out of the fight. Since they're mostly solitary, it's the presence of food that usually leads to many forms of devil communication. Vocalizations are the most obvious. There are at least 11 different kinds of vocalization. One of the most common is the arf sound, which shows curiosity. Other low level sounds are the bark and snort and teeth chattering, which means the devil is uncomfortable. 
As the situation escalates, growling begins. Then full-scale screeching. This is when it's most likely to descend into a brawl or a chase. One of its most frequent communications is yawning. Its jaws can open to an astonishing 75 to 80 degrees wide. Humans can only manage around 33 degrees. A wide gape like this is common in carnivorous marsupials. The tiger quoll, a dedicated meat eater, also opens its mouth extremely wide even as a baby. Yawning is a displacement activity that says, I've got a fine set of teeth here, but at the moment, I'm not interested in a fight. It also helps relieve built up pressure in their oversized jaws. Devils can also communicate via a range of chemical signals, especially in their poop. A diet that's so varied and largely indiscriminate results in disproportionately large faeces. An average scat is around 15 centimetres long, but they can be 25 centimetres. And it can be full of surprises. Items that researchers have found within devil scats include a woolen sock, aluminium foil, the head of a snake, and half a pencil. After a while, the poop turns white, very like a hyena's faeces. This is due to the high levels of bone in both of their scats. Like many carnivores, their poop is pungent and full of information for other devils. All the devils in an area like to poop communally in the same spot, known as a devil latrine. This serves as a kind of community notice board, letting local devils know who visited and when, possibly giving information about their age and breeding condition. Mungo does some marking, known as anogenital dragging. It may look like a male marking his territory, but females also do this, and devils aren't really territorial. The exact purpose of dragging is unknown, but it may be associated with the transmission of chemical signals, a form of communication. Tail positions, erect fur and head elevations are other non-vocal means of communication. In devil society, the female of the species is not the gentler sex, and these two young females are arguing over a scrap of meat. It's not very big, but to a devil, it's still worth fighting over. The girl's stiff legs and high head positions, as well as gaping jaws, signal loud and clear, back off. But if all communication fails, for a devil, a fight is the preferred method of sorting an issue out. Although he has to be subordinate to top dog Carlos, 
Mungo is able to dominate many of the other local devils. Mungo's at the bottom of the bank, warning the other devil not to come any closer. His vocalizations intensify. A win for Mungo. He's chased off the interloper. With this level of daily aggression, it's unsurprising that the devils can sustain damage. Injuries are everywhere. Battered faces, tattered ears, and scarred backsides. This low-ranking male has lost the whole of his upper lip and part of his nose. He tries to avoid other males and get some rest during the daytime. But Mungo is on the prowl. He's a much higher ranking, more aggressive devil. The disfigured devil has to give way. But Mungo hasn't finished making his point. He follows and pins down the other male, forcing him into a confrontation. <laughs> Which leaves the disfigured male cowering. After a hard day, or night, of inflicting or receiving grievous bodily harm, the devil typically retires to its den. It may regularly use three or four dens, and once established, it tends to use the same ones for life. In the mating season, it may share its home, but for the rest of the year, it's a cosy den for one. These tend to be within banks, in dense vegetation near water, or even in a small natural cave. Sometimes it will take the time to dig out its own den in a preferred location. Or it may use a discarded wombat burrow. Wombats are fellow marsupials, although unlike the devil, they're vegetarian. They like similar habitat, and being slightly larger than the devil, their burrows are roomy and make for a spacious devil apartment. Mungo leaves his den to start exploring his patch for food. the disfigured male has blundered into the area, right on top of Mungo's den. If the more dominant devil notices him, he'll be attacked. But his outstanding sense of smell alerts him to the danger just in time before Mungo's able to get into attack position. This time, he gets away safely. Out looking for food, Mungo runs into Carlos. It's a good opportunity to test the waters once more and see who's top dog. <laughs> Carlos.
Carlos once again emerges triumphant, retaining the rights to first claim of a carcass and preferential treatment from the females come breeding season. Carlos retires to his den for some peace and quiet. Although, being a devil, he's not quiet for long. Tasmania is a paradise for animal life, but the devils don't get everything their way. The devil's love of carrion is often their downfall. As they try to feed on an easy source of carrion, roadkill, they frequently become it themselves. But moves are now underway to try and boost devil numbers through a conservation approach known as rewilding. This involves releasing health-checked devils from captive populations into the Tasmanian wilderness. These astonishing carnivores have short but action-packed lives. With their monumental anger management issues and zero tolerance attitude, for a devil, every day is an adventure. Despite treating their fellow devils with extreme prejudice most of the time, they're able to share a meal for the benefit of all. Full of character, their deafening volume, their tenacity, and their ability to clean the land make them one of Tasmania's most fascinating and useful creatures.